afternoon, and welcome to the October installment of Video. My name is Stephanie Thomas. Today, we'll be talking about affirmative action plans. Before we get started, I'd just like to say that I am an economic and statistical consultant and not a lawyer. The information I'll be presenting today should not be construed as legal advice. I'm going to assume that you have a basic familiarity with affirmative action plans. Typically, an affirmative action plan has five parts. First, there's the organizational profile, which is basically an enhanced organizational chart. Next is the job group analysis, followed by a utilization analysis. The utilization analysis is, in my view, the key component of the affirmative action plan. The results of the utilization analysis will guide the last two components of the plan, the placement goals and additional required elements. Common components within the additional required elements include designation of responsibility, identification of problem areas, action-oriented programs, and internal audit and reporting systems. So let's take a closer look at an example affirmative action plan. Here we have the organizational profile. This essentially outlines the structure of the organization. For each major department or group, we see three pieces of information. The gender and race of the head of the department or group, the total number of employees within that department or group, and the gender and race composition of those employees. So, in the administrative group, the head is the general manager, who's a white male. There are six employees who report directly to him. Two are white males, one is a Hispanic male, one is a white female, one is an African American female, and one is an Asian female. We see that there are three departments that report to the administration group, accounting, design, and sales and support. For each of those three departments, we see the gender and race of the manager, the total number of employees, and the race and gender composition of those employees. These three pieces of information are presented for all departments or groups within the organization. Most organizations will already have an organizational chart like this, so to prepare an organizational profile, you just need to add in the gender and race characteristics of the supervisor and the employees within each grouping. The next step is to prepare a workforce analysis. For each of the departments or groups in the organizational profile, you're going to list out each of the job titles within that department or group. And for each job title, we're going to record the total number of employees and their gender and race characteristics. So, looking at our first group, administration, we see that six employees are spread across five job titles, general manager, personnel manager, executive assistant, administrative support, and file clerk. For each job title, we record the number of white males, African American males, Asian males, American Indian males, and Hispanic males. We do the same thing for the female employees. You'll also note that we record the wage rate, the EEO1 category, and job group information. In this example, employees are paid according to a schedule, so we record the schedule and level in the wage rate column. The EEO1 categories are the standard 10 categories you're used to seeing. Executive and senior level officials and managers, first and mid-level officials and managers, professionals, technicians, sales workers, administrative support workers, craft workers, operatives, laborers and helpers, and service workers. We do this for each of our departments or work units. The final step of the job group analysis is to prepare a table that shows where each one of the job titles falls with respect to job group and EEO1 category. So, within job group 1, the officials and managers category, we have the following job titles. General manager, controller, Pricing Billing Manager, Sales Customer Support Manager, Interior Design Manager, Personnel Manager, Installation Manager, Installation Supervisor, and Furniture Repair Supervisor. Within Job Group 2, the Professionals category, we have Interior Designer, 
office space planner, general ledger accountant, payroll administrator, purchasing agent, and pricing specialist. We go through and categorize each of our job titles into a job group and an EEO category. Once we finish this, we're ready to move on to the utilization analysis. Here we have a sample utilization analysis. This analysis is going to be done on a job group basis. For each job group, we compare the number of female incumbents and the number of racial minority incumbents to the total number of incumbents. For job group 1, we have a total of 9 incumbents. None of these 9 are female, so our female incumbency, in percentage terms, is 0%. One of the nine incumbents is a racial minority, so our minority incumbency is one out of nine, or 11.1%. Looking at job group two, we have 22 incumbents, 10 of which are female. So our female incumbency is 10 out of 22, or 45.5%. Four of the 22 are minorities, so our minority incumbency percentage is 18.2%. We go through and calculate the female incumbency percentage and the racial minority incumbency percentage for each of our job groups. Then we're ready to move on to the key piece of the utilization analysis, the availability estimate. Here we have an example of availability. The availability estimate is our external benchmark and how we're going to compare the percentage of women and minorities that we employ to what others are doing, presumably in a non-discriminatory environment. What we're doing with the availability estimate is looking for the percentage of women and the percentage of minorities with requisite skills in the reasonable recruitment area that would be available for us to employ in the position in question. That leads us to the question of one, how do we define requisite skills, and two, how do we define a reasonable recruitment area? I'm going to move away from the sample plan we've been looking at and give you a really simple example. Let's assume we're trying to determine the availability for sales associates in a retail clothing store. There are three questions we have to answer to get to the availability estimate. First, we have to determine what occupations we're going to use for our external benchmark. Next, we have to determine what industries we're going to use. Finally, we have to determine what geography we're going to use. Thinking about occupation, what are our choices? We could use first-line supervisors and managers of retail sales workers. But that doesn't really fit what a sales associate does. This occupation is really geared toward a supervisory role, which our sales associates don't do. So that's not a good fit. What else do we have? Occupation Code 476, Retail Salespersons. Based on the description, this looks like a good fit with what our sales associates do. So let's use Occupation Code 476. What industry code are we going to use? We could look at all industries, or we could narrow it down to just retail trades. Or we could narrow it down even more and look only at clothing and accessory stores. The problem with using the narrowest possible definition is that the availability estimate you'll get is likely to be highly dependent on the characteristics of your workforce. As we narrow our definition, our sample size gets smaller. We have fewer and fewer firms to study, and it's likely that your firm will be a big part of that sample. The point is to get an external availability, so we don't want that. On the other hand, we don't want a definition that's too broad. In this case, we use the middle-of-the-road approach and focus on retail trades. There's no reason to expect that retail salespersons in non-clothing and accessory stores wouldn't be able to sell clothing and accessories. The sales skills are probably highly transferable within the retail industries. So we'll go with retail trades. Lastly, we have to think about geography. How wide of a recruiting area should we use? Where do we expect to draw candidates from? 10 miles? 25 miles? 50 miles? 100 miles? The thing to keep in mind here is how far would a reasonable person be willing to commute for the job in question? 
Generally, the higher the position within the organization, the larger the likely recruitment area. I might be willing to drive 50 miles each way for an executive vice president position that had a great compensation package, but I probably wouldn't drive 50 miles each way to work as a sales associate in a retail clothing store earning 10 or $15 an hour. So the geography that you use will depend on the position you're looking at. And in this case, I think the 25 mile radius is our best choice. You're not limited to 10, 25, or 50 miles of the store location. You can pick any distance. You can also use a city or a metropolitan statistical area or whatever geography you think is appropriate. The key point is that your geography has to make sense for the position you're looking at. So we've decided that we're going to collect data on retail salespersons in retail trades within 25 miles of the store location. And using our census data, we find out that females are 50% of all retail salespersons in retail trades working within 25 miles of our store location. Among the same group, minorities are 35%. These are our external availability estimates. So let's take a closer look at the female availability. What would have happened if we would have used first-line supervisors as our occupation? the availability would have dropped from 50% to 30%. What if we used all industries instead of just the retail industries? The availability would have increased to 56%. What if we used 100 miles instead of 25 miles from the store location? The availability would be 45%. The upshot of this is that the choices you make with respect to industry, occupation, and geography influence your availability estimates. And your availability estimates, in turn, influence whether you are, quote, in compliance. So let's assume that 55% of your retail salespersons are female. Using the availability estimate based on retail salespersons in retail trades within 25 miles of your store location, you have more females than expected. If we change the occupation to manager, you have a lot more females than expected. If we use all industries, you have a shortfall of females. You're not employing as many females as a percentage as expected. And if we use 100 miles, you're employing more females than expected. The way you construct your availability estimate is important. In each of these four examples, the composition of your workforce hasn't changed, but in some cases you have more females than expected, and in one case you have less females than expected. The only thing that changed was the way you define the availability estimate. Given our incumbency in availability percentages, how do we know if we have to take action and establish a placement goal? If your incumbency percentage is larger than the availability percentage, you don't need to establish a placement goal because you're employing more females or minorities than expected. If your incumbency percentage is less than the availability percentage, you might need to establish a placement goal. The rule of thumb that's often used here is the 80% rule. If the ratio of incumbency to availability is less than 80%, a placement goal should be established. Looking at this example, we see that for job group 1, the female incumbency is 0%, while the availability is 47.6%. We need to establish a goal for this job group. We're going to set our goal based on our availability estimate of 47.6%. Let's jump down to job group 5. Our female incumbency is 83.3% and the availability is 87.7%. So our incumbency is less than the availability. The ratio of these two is 95%. We calculate that by dividing 83.3% by 87.7%. Since the ratio is greater than 80%, it's actually 95%, we don't need to establish a placement goal for this job group under the 80% rule of thumb. 
The last portion of the Affirmative Action Plan is the additional required elements. As I mentioned at the beginning, this section will include statements about the responsibilities of the EEO manager, as well as the responsibilities of supervisors and managers. It will also include a section identifying problem areas and the corrective actions the employer is going to take. The final portion of the Required Elements section will include a discussion of the action-oriented programs that the employer is going to undertake. These programs include things like conducting annual reviews of job descriptions to make sure that they accurately reflect job functions and are in line with the performance criteria being used to evaluate employees in those positions, evaluating the total selection process to ensure freedom of bias by evaluating selection methods that may have a disparate impact to ensure that they are job related and consistent with business necessity, training personnel and management staff on proper interview techniques, and providing EEO training for management and supervisory staff, using techniques to improve recruitment and increase the flow of female and minority applicants, hiring a statistical consultant to perform an audit of the company's compensation practices, and ensuring that all employees are given equal opportunity for promotion by posting all promotional opportunities, evaluating job requirements for promotion, and developing and implementing training and educational programs to enhance opportunities for promotion. If you have any questions about anything we discussed during this presentation, please contact me at your convenience. I can be reached by phone at 401-331-6360 or by email at Thomas underscore EEA at mcg-site.com. Thanks for participating in this video presentation, and we hope you'll join us for future installments.